So I was actually going to be talking about what Joel just, just referred to, soil teas. Um, there are uh, some terms out there people may have heard of. Um, uh, Korean natural farming um, is one that's gotten some, some uh, notoriety recently. Uh, indigenous microorganisms, IMOs, is something you can look up online and get a lot of good information about. Uh, people may have heard about um, uh, making bokashi and EM. Uh, there are a number of ways in which you can functionally create your own uh, your own in inoculants. I was going to be talking about IMOs, uh, soil soil teas. So let me just uh, refer to this sort of quickly, and then I'll just make my other comments and and let you let you be. Um, the reason that we need to inoculate our soils and to inoculate our seeds and to inoculate our plants is because they don't have on them or in them that full spectrum of microbes that we understand to be beneficial in the first place. Uh, we were talking about um, colostrum this morning and you know how the baby calf needs its colostrum when it's born to establish its gut flora. Um, and only when that calf does have well-established gut, gut flora does it have a, a really solid shot at a healthy life. We understand that is also true for, for humans and you know this is a general a general concept that we are not organisms, right? We have this idea about kingdoms. There's the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom and the bacterial kingdom. That's not, it's, it's fraudulent, right? We are not, we're not animals per se because the vast majority of the cells in our body are not human. People, a lot of people know this. More than 90% of the cells in your body are not human. If there's 10 trillion cells in your body, one trillion max are human. The rest are other organisms from other kingdoms. We are a symbiotic ecosystem um, and we require good healthy relationships with those organisms for us to be healthy. I think this is a point that numerous people have been making in different manners. Um, when you get a seed, a fungicide covered seed, that's basically like making sure that your calf does not get any colostrum. Anybody ever had a calf that didn't get a colostrum, didn't get colostrum? You know what happens to them? Don't want to talk about it, right? Um, so we, our seeds when they are born, when they germinate, they need their colostrum as well um, to establish good, healthy gut flora, to have a strong and healthy life. And when we purchase seeds in, in many cases, they don't have that, um, that spectrum of species in direct contact with them. If you're putting those seeds into soils that have had um, you know, chemicals or whatever else applied, um, or if you've been applying fertilizer at heavy doses and you've created an environment where a lot of these species have, have died off, um, this is the foundational rationale for why we need inoculation in the first place. Um, I hope I've made that point at least to some extent. Um, there's a couple other points I'd like to make here uh, before I go into the, actually the soil, the soil tea uh, process. I think I said this yesterday afternoon when I was up in the um, upper room when, when Gary was down here talking, so it's, it, I think it bears repeating. Um, there's this uh, uh, element called cobalt, which I think you've heard referred to a couple of times um, in the conversation, and cobalt is the center of the compound referred to as B12. We know about B12. I think, I can't remember who it was was saying they gave their, calf a, their cow a B12 shot and it wasn't blind anymore, um, whatever it is. Um, B12 is known as cyanocobalamin in science. Um, it's, a, it's a chemical, it's a, it's a compound. It's got hydrogens and oxygens and nitrogens, but the center of it is one atom of cobalt. Um, people who are uh, vegetarians or vegans uh, may be told by their doctors that they need to uh, supplement their diet with vitamin B12, otherwise they become anemic or weak or lethargic. Um, actually, if you really don't have enough B12 in your body, you become dead. Right, um, we are B12 dependent organisms. We require a certain amount of this compound in our body to exist. Um, so another way to say that is we are cobalt dependent organisms. We require a certain amount of cobalt in our body to exist. Um, and one thing that's really, really interesting about microorganisms um, and all these sort of you know species in the soil, the bacteria, the fungi, etc., um, is that 80% of those species are also cobalt dependent. Um, so my, you know, I, while I am entirely in favor of the idea of inoculation, compost teas, all these other sort of modes of reestablishing microbial communities, 
um, foundationally, part of the reason why those species aren't there in the first place may be because some of the environmental conditions that they need to exist are not present. Um, we were talking about glyphosate this morning, and everybody seemed like they were a little bit delicate <laughs> about the topic. I think Gary said, uh, we, everybody agrees it's a chelator. Um, it's a chelator. It ties up uh, copper and zinc and cobalt and manganese. It ties them up and makes them unavailable. And the connections to autism and humans are basically that when those elements aren't available, they're tied up, then the microbes in your gut that require them to exist can't exist. So when the copper and the zinc and the manganese and the cobalt are tied up, the microbes in the soil that require them to exist can't exist. So you can add all the inoculants you want, but if the critical environmental conditions necessary for those microbes to flourish aren't present, then you're basically wasting your time. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I like to talk about, you know, obviously the microbes as the bottom of the food chain. This is absolutely the center of everything we're trying to accomplish is a well-established, a well-functioning microbial community. But, um, and amending them is a very important piece of the puzzle, but they also need air to breathe. So if your soil's too tight, they're gonna die of asphyxiation. They need water to drink. If your soil's too dry, they're gonna die of thirst, etc. cetera. So just, just remember that. Um, for me, while amending with inoculation is probably the best bang for your buck of anything, if you're going to add something, if you're going to purchase something, if you're going to, you know, do something small, targeted for a dollar or two or a euro or two per, per hectare or whatever it is that's going to cost you, I think this is a really powerful bang for your buck. Also understand that if you took a, a plane full of humans and dropped them off in northern Greenland and flew away, they'd probably mostly end up dead pretty quick, right? You drop those inoculants into an environment where they don't have what they need to exist and they will die off. So that's just the sort of the um, caveat. So when it comes to the uh, soil teas, um, I'm always in favor of working with, you know, natural, local, free, um, you know, amendments. And I think, you know, in, in many cases, our soils do need to be remediated, do need to be amended, do need to have things added to them. Um, but that does not mean that we necessarily need to spend money. Um, in many cases, you know, we're told that you, the soil doesn't have something, therefore you have to buy something. And I don't think that's always the case. So when it comes to inoculation, um, I like to say, uh, you know, all you need to get a really sophisticated and broad spectrum microbial inoculant is a five gallon bucket and to be willing to go for a walk. Um, so you can tell your, you know, your honey or whoever it is, sorry, honey, I'm, I'm <laughs> gotta go for a walk. It's part of my, part of my work for today. Um, so basically, whether it's a five gallon bucket or a plastic bag, um, the objective here is to hit as many different microclimates as possible. Um, if you can hit a field, a meadow, uh, uh, you know, an edge of a forest, a swamp, a stream, um, you know, as many different microclimates as possible. Think about an area where you like, where you enjoy, and you want to go for a, a walk. Sorry, my phone I had it turned on for a second. Um, what we're looking for as you go for your walk are the plants that have as um, shiny and glossy a leaf, you know, that, that, that stick out because of their shiny, glossy leaves. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else is, I mean, I'm a primarily a vegetable grower, so uh, I'll just use the example of maybe summer squash, zucchini. Um, I guess I have a different word for it, I think. Courgette. Courgette, yes. <laughs> uh, in the springtime, when you've planted this, this, the, the zucchini, and um, it is, you know, it's, it's starting to fill out, and maybe it's getting ready to, to have its first flower or two come out. Um, you'll see in many cases that that plant has this beautiful glossy sheen on it. People familiar with that? That look, that glossy sheen. Um, and then, you know, a month or six weeks later, two, two months later, after it's been, you know, putting out a lot of fruit, you'll see that that, that sheen has dissipated. It is no longer has that nice, that nice gloss. In fact, the leaf may not be quite so dark and green anymore. It may have um, gotten 
uh, you know, the sheen that will dissipate, the leaf will get less, less green and it'll become, you know, white and then brown and then dead. We call this powdery mildew, um, you know, if you're a scientist. Um, that process, what, what, what you're seeing when you're seeing that sheen on the leaf is something I wanted to discuss. Um, because uh, it, uh, plants have this really curious um, strategy that they engage, which is that when they get access to more food than they need, they stockpile the extra food in the form of fat. Anybody ever heard of this strategy? Utilized by living organisms? That's a joke. No, it's too late in the day. You eat too much and you get fat? No? Don't know anything about that? <laughs> when the plants have access to more food than they need, they don't use it all. They stockpile the extra food in the form of fat. And in plants, it's called the waxy, you know, the, the, the a waxy cuticle. So when you see a leaf that has a sheen on it, that means your plant is fat and happy, right? If you've got a cow that's looking really good, right, the coat is glossy, right? And when something's wrong with that cow, you'll see that coat will get dull, right? Before anything else necessarily shows up, you'll see the sheen in the coat dissipate. So we are hardwired with the ability to discern these kinds of things uh, quite readily, I think. Um, and when you see that coat looking, you know, shiny, you're like, my cows are happy. I just know it. It's really, it's right, it's right there in front of my eyes. When your zucchini plant is, is fat and happy, it's got a sheen on its leaves. So plants eat, as do cows, through the byproducts of microbial digestion. So functionally, when a, when a zucchini plant is fat and happy, it is being fed more than it needs by its gut flora, by the microbes in the soil. Does that basically make sense? Yeah? So when you're walking into nature, when you're going for your walk through the field, through the forest, through the swamp, um, looking for plants that have a sheen on their leaves, those plants that have a sheen on their leaves are fat and happy, and they're being fed well by a microbial community that is flourishing. Does that make sense? Nobody's adding fertilizer, nobody's adding anything else. These are plants in nature, and they are obviously doing well. They have a well-established, well-functioning gut flora. And so what I like to suggest is you go for your walk, and you look for plants that have a sheen in their leaves, and you reach down and politely pick up a handful of soil and put it in your bucket. Um, and you want to hit as many different microclimates as possible and as many families of plants as possible to, to harvest from your ecosystem a broad spectrum of vital and vibrant microbial communities. Complicated? Not complicated. Get back home and you can follow exactly the protocols that Joel just discussed for, for, making, a, for making a compost tea. Or you don't even have to do that. You can just take your bucket of, you know, bucket of soil that's half full, cover it with water, stir it up a little bit, pour it out, stick it in a tank, and off you go. Right? You don't need to do anything fancy or complicated. You can simply go and immediately harvest from the ecosystem this broad spectrum of microbes. Um, I like to suggest that the microbes that live in the soil are the ones you should be putting in the soil, and the microbes that live on the leaf surface are the ones you should be putting on the leaf surface. And so I would suggest that if you are going to be getting um, microbes that you want to be using as a foliar spray for the plant leaf, then you would, instead of taking the soil out from underneath the plants, you would be taking the leaves off of the plants and putting them in your bucket and following the same exact protocol. Does that make sense? Nothing too complicated? Um, it's really simple. We are surrounded by microbes. We are, we are dependent upon microbes. Um, and if you're you know, able to and willing to see them in their natural habitat and identify where they're flourishing, um, they're freely available effectively to anyone um, anywhere. So that's the essential point I wanted to convey.